If you were late getting in, you, uh, you missed it, you know? I'm not going to say you can't hug and howdy on your own, but uh, you missed out. It's a little bit odd for me, too. Uh, usually I have a little bit of a chance to get things together here a little bit more, uh, just in regard to nervousness and everything like that. But uh, we're going to jump right on in. Last week, uh, I don't know if the rest of you, but for me, all week long, I did that thing of where I uh, kind of got that earworm started, and, and I was constantly saying, I don't want to sing that song anymore. I want to get that out of my head, that one about this will be the day that we die. Uh, you know, the Don McLean song about American Pie. And, um, you know, whether that was rolling through your mind or not, last week and talking about musical chairs and the picture of the musical chairs being the game that uh, at least I grew up with where uh, the teacher would have the record player with the, uh, the little arm over there and the needle on the end of it that would pick it up and the crackling and the popping. And then there's actually some people going back to that saying that was the best music there was, was when you had the LPs playing and you guys can just go ahead and you can start listening here in a second here, but you know, some of us can reminisce and go back and remember, but they would pick that needle up and when it did, the music would stop and everybody was to scramble for a chair and if you got left out, you're out of the game. And what we talked about then last week was just looking at the time of what happens when the music dies. And there's a variety of ways that that can take place and I don't think I have to go into detail about it, meaning that you each have had experience as I have, times when it seemed like, whoa, what in the world just happened? Nothing will ever be the same again because of what just took place. And sometimes, in some ways, those are very, very true statements. At other times, we think that that's the way it's going to be, but we find out later on that it's not. And that what we oftentimes forget in the shock and the uh, you know, shrapnel that are coming away from what just ever took place in our life, what we sometimes forget is that in that, that the presence of God is still there. His light is still shining and that we have the ability to go ahead and to do something. I left off last week and I'll ask you to turn with me over to the book of Ephesians today. And here in the book of Ephesians, what we read or looked at was a little bit about what God or what Paul told on behalf of God, what he told the church at Ephesus. I want to remind you that this is a church we have a lot, a lot of information at between the book of Acts, the historical book of Acts, and then also in the book of Revelation. Plus, on top of it, Timothy was a pastor that was there after Paul left. Timothy went in, and he was to put things into order. And so what I, when I read Ephesians, I'm looking at what he's trying to do, what Paul's trying to do on behalf of God, and ultimately what God's doing, saying, look, church, you don't know what you're getting ready for, but I'm trying to get you ready for it. And that's what's so sad then when you get to the book of Revelation, you begin to read that this church at Ephesus, that they were doing a lot of things right, but the one thing they weren't doing right is they had forsaken their first love, which was Christ. They failed to keep him number one. I share that with you because as we look at this passage here, and it's not going to be the primary text for today, it's just going to be kind of a diving board. But as we look at that, I share that with you because that's what living a Christian life is all about, is remembering to keep him first, not because we have to. It's because it's best for us. It's because it's what he designed us to do. It's where we're fulfilled and where in that that we will find as we put him first, the good, the bad, and the ugly, we still put him first. And that as we go through those things and we begin to discover that he's able to use every situation and that Romans 8 does come true, that he is working all things to good for those that love him and are called to his purpose. What happens when we fail to keep him first is then we get lost and we kind of do that momentary shock factor that things in life can suddenly go ahead and entirely ruin our life as we would think of it. Because we begin to believe that I can't do anything now. Everything has changed. It's all different now. And whether that's a loss of a loved one, whether that's a loss of a job, whether that's a loss of money, a great investment that you made, the loss of your home, there are all kinds of things. The loss of a spouse, not from death, but rather instead even the living death of divorce. All these things, when they take place, it can make us begin to believe, and that's exactly what the devil wants to do, is to overwhelm us then with this belief that somehow, some way, God has backdoored us and has treated us unfairly. We begin to believe we're Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But I think that's often misunderstood because what the truth of the matter is, Jesus was trying to get his disciples to sing. Because when he starts that out, it's actually a psalm, Psalm 22, where it begins out with, a, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what it turned into was this, this battle of the mind that everybody, if you're going to be an effective believer, you've got to begin to learn. 
the battle of the mind that instead of looking at and seeing things that are overwhelming, look to him who says, nothing is impossible for me. And I'm not trying to push you to do that. I'm not trying to be a preacher telling you because that's what every preacher said. No, no, I'm really saying the way to go ahead and to live your life out is by turning and going ahead and saying, I can't see clearly here, but Lord, you've got the view that's important. If this is going on in my life, you're not surprised. Whether you sent it, you at least allowed it to happen. And what happens is we want to begin doing battle with God because that's exactly what the enemy wanted to do. Allah, the book of Job, or Job as some of you might want to call it. But in the book of Job, what we have is that Job's going through a scenario where everything changed. He lost 10 kids. He lost all of his crops. He lost all of his servants except one that came back to tell him. He lost all of his animals, and he was a wealthy man. He lost everything. And what Job chose to do was to do what Paul is trying to tell the Ephesians to do, what Paul himself had learned to do, and that is as we go through things, there's one thing that the devil can't keep us from doing if we're willing to faithfully put ourselves into it. And that's what we read here in chapter 5. And so Ephesians chapter 5, if you will, and let's pick up with verse uh, 23. Actually, it's 25. Got to get these glasses. Actually, it's 15. I am so sorry. <laughs> Maybe you need a stronger script, huh? Okay, yeah, verse 15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Well, that would make sense, right? Be a wise guy. Don't be an unwise guy. Wise guys people don't really like, but unwise guys they hate. But uh, so be very wise. Making what? The most. Making absolutely the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. Saying that there are going to be things that are going to take place and evil is in this world. I don't have time for the sermon today, but one of these days we'll go back and revisit. But Jesus was very clear about the fact that even though he was going to establish his church so that his will could be done on earth just like in heaven, he didn't take authority over everything. He showed he had the authority with the wind, the waves, and everything else. He could go ahead and not only uh, could he make food out of a little bit of a meal for 5,000 men and the women and the children, but on top of that, that he could raise the dead. So Jesus has this great capability and everything like that, but he wants us to understand that there are going to be things that take place, and when it does, when the evil days come, it's because the devil's still here. It's his world. God made it, but he allowed him to do it. Personally, I believe God put it in the midst of where Satan was dwelling in the darkness and everything, but, but it's the devil's. Jesus even said, this is your hour when darkness reigns. The same darkness that's found over there in Genesis 1 is found there in the Gospels when he's on the cross and it's what? Utterly dark for three hours. And so I want us to see this because what we forget is we keep wanting to make heaven on earth. And, and I'm not saying it's not good to be optimistic and I'm not saying we ought to make the best of what we've got. He's saying that here. But we're to take advantage of the opportunities. And the opportunities afforded to us don't only come when we hit the lottery. They come when it looks like everything, just like in Job, got sucked up. Job did this very thing that Paul's encouraging us to do. He said, be very careful how you live, not as unwise but wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish. Don't lose your head. But instead, understand. Grab onto your thoughts. Grab onto them. Understand what the Lord's will is. I know in uh, some correspondence I've had with Zach Dietz that as he went into the Marines, I mean, he was expecting one thing and it was like that, but it was so different. The isolation, the feeling of being overwhelmed were great. And one of the things that was fun to do was to feed him scriptures, uh, or at least to talk to him about that and to have the mindset that this is when you really draw down upon God. And I think it resulted in not what I did, but rather instead what Zach had as foundation behind him, what he did then in applying the scriptures, got him to the point that he said, man, I don't want to go through life alone. I want to know that I've got Jesus. And he was baptized here that Sunday right before Christmas. I share that with you because I want you to understand that's what we're in. And chapter six of this same book goes on into the spiritual warfare, right? And it says that, you know, we have an enemy, but we ought to know how to fight him because we have the artillery, and the great thing about that is most of it's right here in our mind. It's where faith dwells. It's where belief happens. It's where trust becomes. That we, in our mind, we recognize and we see something. We might be overwhelmed at the moment, but we time out, wait a minute. Let me grab, grab, get a grip on this. And like Job, we go, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. But what does he say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. He chooses to bless the Lord. 
And that's what Paul goes on into. So as these things come out, we understand, we need to understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And then he says, speak to one another with psalms. So we can share the psalms as Jesus did in, in, with Psalm 22 from the cross, with hymns and with spiritual songs. Sing, and then he tells us, and this is in a commanding type way, and I mean, I don't mean that Paul's got a bony finger out here at the Ephesians, but he's saying, man, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. You ever made anything? I mean, some of you are just used to everybody serving you so you don't make a thing. You just get yourself ready, maybe wash your hands and sit down and eat. But somebody along the line had to make the food, right? Somebody had to earn the, the, or make a living uh, by earning the, the, the dollars that bought the food, and then somebody had to prepare the food. And that's what this is talking about here, is there comes a point in time when Kale's not going to be up here to lead you in music. I'm not going to be there to lead you in the Scripture. What you've got to do is to draw from within and from what God has given you with the power of His Spirit, and you can make the choice. You can declare to yourself, I'm going to sing, and I'm going to make music in my heart. The music may have died over here, but hey, I've got a new tune. I'm not listening to American Pie. I'm listening to Heavenly Pie. Maybe it's right there by Shepherd's Pie. I don't know. But, you know, you know I'm, I'm thinking of, that would be me. That's when you, I die, you eat me because I'm the shepherd. You know, so you go ahead and put it in the mashed potatoes and the, all the vegetables. That's a good thought. Next week, right? So, hey, you're going to have Shepherd's Pie. What else? But, but it, we have this opportunity. And what it really boils down to, and any of us that have watched old TV, We've all seen people, whether it's in cartoons or whether it's in characters that play it out, that go crazy and just, ah, and somebody smacks them upside the head and whap. Thanks, I needed that. You know, the old commercial used to do. But, but why? Because they're losing their head. They're not choosing to think. They're just simply responding and reacting with being overwhelmed. And I'm not saying that I've never been overwhelmed. I'm not saying that there aren't things that are shocking. I'm not saying that there haven't been things that have shaken me to the core. I'm just saying you begin to live again, to breathe again, when you decide to make music to the Lord. That you draw from within the Holy Spirit that God has given you. You draw from the Scriptures, knowing how God's done. And this is what's really vital and what too many Christians fail to do, I think. You draw from your past experiences. Not with people, but with God. You go back to the last time, at least, that you thought, this is it. And whether it's the end of your life or the end of the life as you had known it or whatever. And you begin to recognize that God brought me through it. And God brought me through it. And God brought me through it. It's the Horatio Spafford story of him losing his family at sea. And he pens a song and actually gets on a boat and goes back out to where they were. And those, you know, though the sea billows roll, it is well with my soul, he said. That's where I love this phrase, and I love the songs, and there's more than one of them, but the old hymn even, Bless the Lord, O my soul. It comes from something, I believe it was David, but at least one of the psalmists said. And the reason I'm saying that is, I have to tell my soul to bless God. Because you see, what's in control should not be our emotions, but what? Our faith. You. It's why we fast at times, and we give up things for God. Because we have to know, because we choose to, so that we can be like Paul, that we don't let our emotions carry us away, but rather instead, what we get carried away with is our faith. And, and again, I don't mean to be barking at you, or sh I just, I hate seeing you suffer unnecessarily. And suffering happens when you lose your way, and su suffering happens when you lose track of God. Suffering happens when you get so focused on something that you fail to see the big one in the room, God. But we can choose to go ahead and say, in spite of what it seems is going on, in spite of this great loss, I choose to bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, praise His holy name. When we begin to take those steps, I'm telling you, it's like the devil, if he was a, uh, you know, a bird a predator that had you caught up in his talons and is carrying you off to eat you, when you begin to praise, it's almost like he can't stand it and he releases you. And it doesn't mean that instantaneously, and if I could snap my fingers, I would, but I'll have John do it for me. Can you snap your fingers for me, John? That one really, there, that's a lot louder. That's more like mom did and, uh, when she's trying to get our attention. But, but just like snap, it's not like instantly everything comes into play, but instantly everything can change inside because there's a light, there's some gas to the flame, there also then is a breath that we can take, 
If you will, let's pray. God and Father, may we learn with your help and your Holy Spirit's powerful guidance with a desire not to always be waylaid. And Lord, for some of us, as we look back, it doesn't take much to knock us off and for our music to die. And Lord, we oftentimes will even be like what Esau was when he came in and said, give me something to eat because I'm going to die. We, Lord, oftentimes trade that which is extremely valuable for that which is cheap just because of feelings. And Lord, today I just would pray to be an encouragement to this body of believers that have encouraged me in so many ways to, Lord, share with my friends that I love and I like, my family of God that you've given me here. I pray today, Lord, to be an inspiration, but not me. I just pray to be a vessel, Lord, that they can be inspired by you because your inspiration is eternal. Holy Spirit, I, I so want to uh, be your friend and wish I could inoculate everybody with you because you certainly are the antibody for every disease we would ever face. But one of the biggest ones I see already happening in our world when things are overall really still pretty good compared to most people. It seems like, Lord, that so many are in despair. When I hear how many are dying from one thing and another, and Lord, it's not the diseases near so much as it is the self-inflicted things that go on, the addictions that take life. And if not the physical life, Lord, they zap the other life the life that we should have that we live out. And God and Father, I just pray today to be that encouragement to these that are here and to those that might be listening in. So, Lord, that we do begin to operate not near so much off our emotions. And I don't want to become emotionless. I don't want to become unsympathetic. At the same time, I just don't want to lose, Lord, what we have with our faith in you and pray that we could begin to understand that, Lord, this is still the devil's world. But you are still the prince, Lord, of the entire universe. And you will someday take your authority and rule even here as you destroy this place and make new. So God, today, please speak through me, uh, to me, so that I don't, Lord, and it scares me to preach messages like this because I don't know what's going to happen this week. But I know one thing, Lord, you won't change. And I give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So from here, if you will, let's go back to the Gospel of John and let's look at a story that maybe we can relate with in some regard. In this book of John, uh, the Gospel, John is uh, James' brother. Uh, they quickly, they're early disciples, it seems, of John the Baptist start following Jesus. In the following of him, they were also, uh, you know, fishermen with Peter and Andrew. Uh, not that they had the same business, but they were in the same industry and they shared together. John writes different than some of the other Gospels do. He doesn't spend any time at all talking much about Jesus' birth. He goes back before that to say in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God and is referring to Jesus Christ. But now here in chapter 11, in the life of Christ, when he started his ministry at 30, he begins meeting these people and he calls 12 of them to become his disciples. In the midst of this, he continues to meet other people. And those people also follow him. So there were the 12 disciples, but there were... 100, 200, sometimes thousands, but, but at least another good, strong, solid 100, 120 people that stick with Jesus throughout his three and a half years of ministry, okay? And in those, then, there was this family, and we're not given a whole lot of things, and there was a brother and two sisters, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Now, one of the things that we've done, and I've preached on before, too, is with uh, Martha, because uh, she was upset with her sister Mary not helping out the way that she thought she should because they invited Jesus in and they got the whole meal thing going on. Somebody has to make the meal, you know, and, and she's instead sitting in there in the living room at the feet of Jesus just listening to him. And Martha gets pretty upset because she's like, hey, tell her to help me out. Jesus said she's picked a more worthy thing. What's ironic is, is the same Mary then that sat at the feet of Jesus was also one that, and it's speculative and so hard with the name Mary that gets used and then other stories, and, but, but she nonetheless was one that went ahead and, and anointed Jesus and wept over him and was recognized for that. And so this is the family. This is the family that, although Jesus has his 12 this family was just one of the ones that, uh, that at least were written about. I'm not saying they were the only ones, but they were three people that there were in, there's a good tight fellowship and a fondness, a loving kind of a liking kind of a likeness or a love, a liking kind of a love. 
because sometimes we have to love people, even our enemies, and sometimes we have to love even our family, but you don't have to like anybody, right? But when you do, you do. And so there's this chemistry going on, just like when, you know, you're free and easy with people and everything seems to roll. Well, what we have this story then is this close relationship now hits a snag. Now, there was a man named Lazarus, and he was what? Sick. sick. Anybody ever been sick? Oh, yeah. Fun? Anybody want to do it again? No. He was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Bethany just happened to be just outside. I mean, Bethlehem was outside of Jerusalem, but it was like six miles. Bethany is like a, within a mile of Jerusalem, just across the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives, on the other side, that hilltop over there, that's Bethany. That's where they're from. So Jesus was in the vicinity, or not in the vicinity, they were in the vicinity of Jerusalem, and uh, he was sick. So it says, this Mary, verse 2, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. And you remember there was misunderstanding about that, and some Judas even, well, that money could have been used, and the truth was, he said, I would have liked to have used it, but nonetheless... She did this, okay? A very strong act of humility. So on top of liking them, on top of knowing them, of being invited into their home and everything, they also have this other thing that went on with the deal with her anointing him and, and him talking about it and, and shining upon it, saying what she's done is noble. She prepared me kind of for my, my death. And so this tight relationship, you know, I mean, We've all got friends, but then we've got good friends, and then you've got what? Real good friends. And a friend in need is a friend indeed. Not that we talk about deeds very often that way, but no, is absolutely a good friend. And so they're friends. And it says that uh, so Lazarus is sick, so the sisters sent word to Jesus. Now, they could have texted him, but they couldn't. They could have called him, but no, they couldn't. So what could they do? Write him a letter? Nope, they couldn't even do snail mail. What they had to do was to get somebody who was a messenger or another friend of theirs and say, hey, last we knew Jesus was, because that's the other thing. I mean, who could keep track of where he was, you know? I mean, he walked across the water, so people had to go around. And, uh, but anyway, they sent word. Not an easy task is what I'm trying to imply here. So crisis, hey, Lazarus is sick. Oh, Lazarus is sicker. Uh, Lazarus is really sick now. And so they send word for Jesus to go, uh, would you pray for him? No, they said, would, he's sick. So we wanted to let you know. They didn't even tell him what to do because they already knew what he would do. Just like when we have stuff happening in our lives, we know what Jesus can do and we presume what he will do. And what creates real crisis is when he doesn't do what we hope, plan, think he ought to do right? Because it's easy to mess that up. It's easy to tell Jesus what he ought to do for us. I mean, there's even a, and, and I think we have to be very careful with it. There's a, a scenario that sometimes we believe we have to agree in prayer, meaning that you say exactly what I say. And, and I think agreeing in prayer really is, no, I agree to take it to the Lord and I agree the Lord can do anything. But I agree that we pray in Jesus' name means we do just like Jesus did in the garden when he said, not my will, but thine be done. I'm not into telling Jesus what to do. I don't find a place where I'm supposed to. I don't think, I think we can present our request before him. We're told that. We can sing to him. We can adore him. We can worship him. But man, I don't ever want to lose track of he's here and I'm here. Way down. I don't have any more clout than any of you. Some people think, you're a preacher. You know, you've got this time invested, so he listens to your prayer. No, he does not listen to mine any more than yours. In fact, he may listen to yours more than mine because you know how some voices after a while, he's just like, you don't, hear, you don't want to hear him? That's what I feel like sometimes. He's going, okay, here we go again. You know, no, and I, I'm not trying to put him down. I'm just saying, man, throughout the scriptures, we're told, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. Exalt yourself, and he will humble you. I think that's a good order to go in. I would rather him exalt and me humble myself than... It's just, anybody ever had God humble you? It's not a fun picture, is it? No, it's not enjoyable. Um, so my point being, though, is 
We've got to be real careful of our expectations of God and telling God what to do. I don't think that he minds us hearing our imagination. I think that's what Jesus shared with him in the garden. I don't think he minds at all us saying, Lord, you know, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. He doesn't mind. But I think it's absolutely appropriate to say, but you do what you know is absolutely best because you're the one, not me, that can work it all together for good. I can look at it and go, this will work out for my good. But if it doesn't do good for the universe and for the cause of Christ, it may not be the best. So they send word, come on, Jesus, do the deal, man. You're the Lord. Can we back up and think about how many different ways, and I don't have time to go through the Gospels today, I won't take time to, but Jesus healed a variety of different ways, didn't he? I don't know if you've ever done that. I encourage you in your next time you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it's a good thing to do at least once a month. But just start noting how many different ways Jesus healed. I think that's what's so cool about Christ with the miracles and the different things. He could have done it the same way, but he wanted us to know there's no formula. I mean, it's just so cool because we know that he touched people and they were healed. We know that he spoke, said the word, they were healed. I mean, we know that he made mud out of spit and dirt and put on a guy's eyes and he was healed. We know another guy just, he touched him and he was healed. I mean, it's just fun watching Jesus in all these ways. So I don't know if they had a plan for it, but they're just saying, he's sick, you can do something and you should, right? Because you really, really, really like Lazarus. Well, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death, which is ironic, especially if you know the story like I do. No, it's for God's glory. What's it for? God's glory. What's your life for? No matter whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, do it to the glory of God. Do it for His, to shine. So people see, and Lord, you're the one. We're doing this for you. He said, no, it's for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified. Early in the same book of John chapter 9, you can read about the guy that was born blind, and they tried to come up with why. And Jesus said, it's for the glory of God. It wasn't his parents that sinned or the guy that sinned in the womb like what all the prognosticators believed at the time. We've got all kinds of, of, you know, scenarios and little things that we think, but man, are they biblically based? But they believed if somebody had a malady, it was obviously a sin-related thing. And I've heard people say that before too. I have to look at the scriptures and go, "Mm, not necessarily, because God takes credit for certain things and how he makes people. And it's not what I might want for me or even for somebody else. But I always got to give room for him to have this glory thing going on here, man. I never know what he's going to do with it. So Jesus said, well, it's for God's glory. He loved, and I love the fact that John brings this out, because he was sitting there with the guys when Jesus got the word. And I'm sure he's already packing his overnight or getting ready to go with the rest of the guys going, man, it's Mary and Martha, and they're asking for Jesus, and Lazarus is dying. You know, he's got a sickness unto death, and let's go. Man, I know one thing. We're going to hit the trail. Let's go. I don't know how far away they were, how many days walk or whatever it might have been, but, but John writes in here, he is expressing to you and me reading this history, he really loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard Lazarus was sick, he what? Did the impossible. He stayed there where he was two more days. Two days when you're walking, you got to walk to where you're going. Man, you just lost a bunch of time, didn't you? I want to encourage you to camp out on that, not today, but maybe make a mark in it or do something, come back to it. I think one of the greatest prayers that we can pray is, God, be like to me like you were to Jesus. You help me to know what's a crisis and when to move. Sometimes we just want to be liked by people, and so we're Johnny on the spot. It's more important to go at the right time when God knows. So just encourage you with that. But then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. He stayed there two more days, and so they're kind of just hanging out. And then he goes, all right, guys, let's go. Where are we going next? Judea. Uh, Why now? I mean, why do we wait two days? Rabbi, they said a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there? He said, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man that walks with, uh, by the day will not stumble, for he sees uh, this world's light. 
when it, it, it is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. And that's one of those that if I was a disciple, I would do just like I am now going, what? What the crud did that mean, you know? Yoda, can you go ahead and straighten that out? I didn't quite understand what you were trying to say. I mean, I understand the principle, and I'm not making fun of Jesus. I don't have to say that to you. I say that to him. I'm really not making fun of him. He can do with me anything that he might want to do. Strike me right now. You're pretty close, Paul, so be careful. All right? But he goes into this light and dark thing. What all do you mean? I don't have time for it. I can't really tell you I fully understand. I'm just saying if I'm one of the disciples, that's not the response and the reaction I'm thinking because I'm still perplexed. Why in the crud did we sit here for two days because the guy that you really love and his sisters ask you, don't you know that we're, they meant for us to come and you're supposed to do something? You didn't even have us pray for him. You didn't have us go, go you know, do a long distance prayer where you reach out. We all reach out together and say, man, let's reach over there to Bethany and God in the name of Jesus Christ, he be healed. He didn't even do that. So they're perplexed. And now he gets into this light and darkness thing. But what it's really hidden in there is what he's talking about is there's the earthly kind of darkness and light, and then there's the spiritual. In the spiritual realm, God is light. The Satan or the devil or the evil one is what? Darkness. It's that Greek word skotos. It's the darkness that is of evil nature. It's the darkness that Genesis 1 talks about that was there in the beginning. It's the darkness that when he said, let there be light, the light was stronger than the darkness. But he didn't make the sun and the moon and the stars for three more days of, of how it was he was, how long the days were that he was creating there. But anyway, after this, after he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. It's a phrase that's often used about death in the New Testament. It ought to be an encouragement to us because the believer in God's eyes, that's what it is. It's just a sleep. It's not permanent. It's not forever. It is for us on earth, but it's not to him in heaven. But he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to what? Is that good or bad? That'd be good. That'd be real good, right? If you're the one that's hopeless at this point in time. I'm going there to wake him up. His disciple replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. That's what happens when you're sick, right? You sleep and you get better. You heal. Jesus had been speaking of death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, hey, dummy. That's if he was talking to me. Lazarus is dead. I'm saying sleep, trying to be kind of nice here. But no, the reality is he's dead. But it's a death that to God is just like sleep. You understand it. Him waking you up in the morning is no different than him waking you up from the grave. For God, it's easy. Hey, Steve, get up. <laughs> I was in the middle of a great dream. No, we're not going to say that when God says to get up, right? I don't know, do we? Do we get up when he says? Anyway, that's a whole other scenario, another sermon. But anyway, he says now, he said, man, I want you to know he's dead. And for your sake, listen to this. This sounds pretty crass, doesn't it? I'm glad I wasn't there. Why? Normal human reaction, emotional reactions. Don't say that. That's not nice. Anybody agree? And what I want you to see here, I mean, this is peeling back the layers and seeing the humanity of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus wrapped up in one is what he is. But it's real vital to understand. You see, it didn't rock his world. Why? He could sing and make music in his heart. You say, well, he was God. He knew what was going to happen. Yeah, and guess what? With your, your, your closest crisis going on in your life are about to come. He's what? He's God and he knows what's going to happen. Does that make sense? I mean, that's what we ought to draw from. It's no different than Lazarus. Let me tell you what, God didn't love, Jesus Christ didn't love Lazarus one bit more than he does anybody in this room or anybody in the world. That's the good news. He loves us, and he doesn't love us rank and file. He doesn't love one more than the other. He doesn't tell us if he likes us better than one or the other, but he loves us equally, deeply. He doesn't love you any more or any less than anybody else. You go, well, how can you do that? And you that are parents can know. There's times that you don't like your kids, but you still love them, right? There's some of the kids you like a whole lot better, but... It's easier to feel love, the emotional kind, but 
But the motherly or the fatherly kind of love, it doesn't make any difference. It just makes it so difficult when you try to express that love and it's not received, right? And that's the way God is. He loves us. And I want you to grasp this, that Jesus is telling them, he said, man, I'm glad I wasn't there. And the reason he can say that is God's got a plan. And let me tell you what, when God doesn't show up the way that you think that he ought to, it's not because he's late. He's got a plan. And he can do anything. And he can work all things to what? The good. For not just you and me, but for anybody and everybody. That's the great news. And you see, when we get stable is when we have this foundationally in our minds. And when in our soul that the winds begin to blow, we stop and say, wait a minute. And you take the stance that is prepared because this is the devil's world and he is against us. He was against us before God and Jesus Christ came into our life. He's certainly against us now, but he's not stronger than us if we're in the Lord. He's only stronger than us if we get like Eve and we get out there by ourselves close to the tree without inviting God to come along. And so I want us to see this. Why? Because it will help you live a longer life because stress and anxiety and that forlorn, oh, doesn't increase life. But it's the way that humans react. And you and I that have accepted Jesus Christ we're no longer only human. We are also divine. We're the children of God. And I'm just saying, not that we can't have any emotions. I'm just saying, but we ought to be able along the line to put those emotions into check with facts based on faith. And this is one of those. He said, I'm glad for your sake I wasn't there, that you may believe, but let's go to him. And so what he's saying here is this thing with Lazarus dying is actually going to be a great thing, and I'm glad I wasn't there because not only this for the glory of God, but on top of that, I want you guys to know, and he doesn't tell them that, but it's what he's implying, you guys are going to believe more than you've ever believed once you see what we're about to do. When we're going through something difficult and we can remind ourselves of Roman that God is working this to the good, what we're doing is we're basically giving God the freedom not to work it to my good. It may not be a pleasant situation. It may be heartbreaking or whatever. But faith says he can use this for eternal good. Faith also tells me he may use this for my good. I may need to go through this. I think one of the biggest mistakes that we make as Christians is somehow or another, we think if we just had everything go our way, our life would not only be nice, but we would be great Christians because we could be joyful always and, and you know, be thankful and all these things you're supposed to do because look how nice my life is. But the reality is, is God knows what you need. There's a reason that he has these little babies that are balled up inside come out and all they can do for about the first six months is... <laughs> what are they doing? I don't know. It's kind of cute at first, and then it's kind of weird. If you, I mean, if adults do it, it's real weird, just like I just did, right? It's really weird. <laughs> you know? I mean, but they shiver, they shake, they reach, and they, then they pull their... Man, don't you wish you could still pull your foot up and touch it? With, not that I want to kiss my toes or anything, but, man, that's flexibility. But no, what's it all about? God is teaching them or is creating in them this movement to strengthen muscles and to uh, provide coordination. He does it when they're that size so they don't look as ridiculous if he waited until they were six, <laughs> let alone 60, you know. But, I, but the point being here is spiritually, there is a part you have to learn how to crawl sometimes before you can walk, and you've got to learn how to walk before you can run, and you've got to learn how to run before you can do the marathon. There's also things that God allows to happen to us, like physical illness and things like that, that we get, that we hate, but by having that bug and fighting it off, we're stronger to have the one that would kill us at an ill opportune time for the Lord. There are things that God's continually doing, and He's doing it for your good, but the good can be eternal, certainly, but a lot of it is good so that we begin to grow up. But nothing grows well that has no resistance. I know there's a story about the certain kind of fish that they used to do in these big tankers, and they would ship them across the sea to bring them to America to sell. And, and, and I don't even, I'm sorry, I can't remember what kind of fish it was at the time. But 
when it got here, it still had a decent flavor, but the meat was mushy. You know, you expect fish to be a little soggy because it's in water, but, you know, it was mushy. And so what they found, that if they put in one of these little sharks in the tank, guess what the fish kept doing? Swimming. And by swimming, instead of just saying, we're going to get eaten, we're going to get eaten, they didn't want to get eaten by this little critter here, so they kept moving, and the meat was firm. I think there are a lot of Christians that probably, if we were honest about it, we're on the soft side, right? And although the Pillsbury Doughboy is kind of cute, <laughs> you know, is there really anybody that wants to be a doughboy or a dough girl? It's a shape, all right, but not the kind of shape we want to be in. And what God wants to do is to firm up and to tone our spiritual muscles so that what? So we'll be prepared and ready for the next big thing that he knows is coming that we can't even see. People that think they want to know and wish they could see their life laid out before them. No, I don't think you do. You would faint. But God knows that you and he together and the people he's placed you around can go through it. Way off the subject here, but let's go back. So I'm glad it's for your sake that you may believe. And he's talking to people who are already disciples, but let's go to him. So Thomas called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let's also go. We can die with him. Now, on one hand, it was like, that was melodramatic Thomas, you know, but Thomas seemed to be that way. I don't know if he just had a flare or what, but, you know, I won't believe it unless I can, you know. Then when Jesus did, he said, well, I didn't really mean it that bad, you know. And here he's going, Oop, if we're going to die, we're going to die. Because remember, last time they went to Jerusalem, they tried to kill Jesus. So on his arrival, Jesus found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for how long? Four days. Man, so he waited two, and we don't know how many it took him to get there, but we know he was dead, so somewhere in the, this four-day time. Anyway, Lazarus got entombed, been in there. Bethany was uh, uh, less than two miles from Jerusalem. Many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brothers. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Now, I don't know for sure I can read anything into that, but... Sometimes we don't go out to greet somebody if we're just a little bit ticked off, right? Anybody here ever pout? I'm not just talking about when you do your selfie. I'm talking about pouting, you know. When you go stand in front of the mirror to look at yourself and go, oh, <laughs> Come on, give it up. Guys, guys, yeah, yeah. I mean, guys, come on, man. I mean, any of us that are married, we've had our pouting times where it's just like, okay, we'll just be real quiet. Don't say anything. So they'll do what? What's wrong? So we can say, nothing. <laughs> it goes both ways, ladies. I mean, man, you do the same thing. Well, I just quit asking because I didn't want to know. I thought, if something's wrong, I'm going to wait till you decide to reveal it, you know? But anyway, I have no idea, but I get this strong feeling that Mary's just kind of like, okay, Jesus is coming a little late now. That was big of you, right? We do these things. We already have these arguments in our mind. Well, she'd already given up on Jesus because, man, he didn't come through when she expected him to. That's when the music dies, folks. I mean, she lost her brother, but she compounded it by not believing in Jesus. The people that you're sitting with right now, we're all going to die unless Jesus comes first. But we're all going to die. We will. It's... Biblical fact. So it's not about dying. It's about dying when the Lord wants us to. It's about dying. And going back to the, the song American Pie, he said, this will be the day that I die. I want to challenge you to go ahead and you start making up your mind and with the Lord's help say, this will be the way that I die. Now, I don't mean by that how we get, how actually our body expires. You know, we just go into sleep or whatever. I'm just talking about the way that we die we can determine because we can determine to die faithfully. It's the greatest way. It's what the scriptures continually point to. Jesus talks about that kind of faith. He is faithful till the end. And so that's what's important here. It's, it's about not dying because we gave up on God, not dying because we gave up because he took so-and-so. It's, it's about instead, it's about living for him. And hopefully I'll get to that. But going on through the story here. So Mary stayed at home. Lord Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, uh, my brother would have not have died. Now, how did she know that? What Jesus knew was if he'd have come and let him die, then he'd have really been in a stew, Right? 
if he'd have answered and come at their beck and call and showed up there and done nothing, I have no idea what kind of venom would come out that time. But she said, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And there's a truth to that. But it's important that it's what God will do according to Jesus, not what God will do according to us. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha had enough theology. She understood that. She said, I know he'll come again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I'll tell you, there's a passage, probably not a passage any more important to remember than that one. I am the resurrection. I am what life is all about. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. You see, the way we die ought to be with Jesus, right? And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Obviously, he's not talking about physically. He's talking about eternally. He's talking about this soul and spirit that are within. Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. And this is where, again, I want you to analyze yourself, but I find in my life that there have been times where, yes, I believe in Jesus, and I believe that no salvation except through him. I gave my life to him. I believe he can do anything. But at the same time, I don't allow that belief to let me sing because I'm still disappointed in the way he didn't perform. You've got to recognize that human being, the human side of you, to let the divine shine through and become stronger. That's why the Holy Spirit was given alongside of our spirit, the paraclete, was so that we can comprehend these things even when they're beyond comprehension. But we can have that peace that passes all understanding, that defies logic, and the peace that comes from God. Because we believe He is the resurrection and the life. We believe that nothing is impossible for him. And if he didn't perform, it's because it's not the best for us or whoever's involved. There's something else he's wanting to do. Anyway, so she does believe, and that's great. But the thing is, she believed with a conditional belief instead of this unconditional belief. And I fear that that's what's happened to the American church. We believe in Jesus as long as we get what we want. We believe in Jesus as long as he does what we want him to do. And if he doesn't, we'll still believe him because we don't want to go to hell, but we're not going to be excited about it. We're not going to sing anymore to him, right? Anyway, after that, she said this. She went back, called her sister Mary, and some of this becomes, it's not redundant. I just don't have time to go through it all. She makes sure that she knows the teacher hears and he's asking for you. And Mary heard this. She did get up quickly and went to meet him. Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had left him or met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, knows how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. This mourning thing back in that day was huge. I mean, they actually paid people to come and cry um, just to make sure there were plenty of people around that was just kind of this superstitious type deal the way they did that. Um, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, and I mean, this is a, from a humble position at his feet, the ones that she had washed and kissed. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, so she wasn't just saying this, it was through tears, tears of... Uh, being overwhelmed of emptiness, of that forlorn feeling of, wow. So she's telling him, Lord, if you'd have been here, the sobbing just starts happening. But Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews that had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. I want you to know that as I have tried to remind you that we are no longer only human, but we are also divine. Jesus was completely divine and became human. Now that's not astounding to you, I'm sure, but what Hebrews really lets us in on, it's so cool the way it unfolds so much of this about Jesus, but that 
he was made in the flesh so that he could sympathize with our weaknesses. He was tempted in the flesh so that he could understand what it is to be torn and looking both ways and how hard it is to tell the devil no. That he also, that one of the things is, is God, he knew everything, but yet it said that, get, get this, this is one of the coolest verses in Hebrews. It says that he learned, the God that knows everything, learned, you know what from? Suffering. So he could relate with us. It's vital that we nail down some of these things about who Jesus is so that when we're losing it, we have something to grab onto, some nails that we can hold on to, a handle we can grab so that we don't lose it completely. I want you to know there is nothing wrong with crying. My dad even told me that. You don't quit crying, I'll give you something to cry about. But there's a difference between the things that we cry about. And, and this isn't to be mean. This isn't to be a caustic. This isn't because I'm judging you. It's for me. I mean, and look who, who cries here at this church more than anybody. Me. You know, I'm sorry. But I don't like it. I hate it. And I ask him to let me quit. But he hasn't yet. So I'm not making fun of people that cry. I just want us to think about what it is that we cry about. And I want us to know that we don't cry alone when it's sincere. And if you're crying because you're overwhelmed, let those tears flow to the throne so that you can be comforted. The worst thing that we can do is to stay in that isolation and not allow ourselves to be comforted by the Christ. And that's what I'm saying is somewhere along the line, we, take a, we get a grip on our emotions, and it doesn't mean there are no more tears. We get a grip on our emotions, and we begin to play it in a way that we give it to God, believing. Not only can he resurrect, believing. Not only can he heal, believing. Not only can he do all those things, but believing. He couldn't love us more, believing that he will work this to good, Believing that, because somewhere along the line, one of the things that needs to happen in the midst of the sobs is you've got to catch your breath. And what I want to encourage you to do is catch his breath, because he's there. And it's what keeps the devil from being able to reel you into the darkness of the pit. Jesus cried. He wept. Where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus said, see how they loved him? or the Jews, excuse me, said, see how he loved them. But some of them could not, uh, some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? About time for a new Bible. I've got too many things written in here. Um, and it's a great question. Well, you know, fine, you're here now. If you can open the eyes of the blind, couldn't you have gone ahead and healed him? And the truth is what? Yes, he could have, but he didn't. So Jesus once more deeply moved. And this means the same thing. This, he felt it, this, this gut-wrenching emotion. And it doesn't say that he cried, but it doesn't say that he didn't. Once more deeply moved came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across it. He said, take away the stone. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead men, by this time there's a bad odor, for he's been there four days. That's my favorite verse in the Bible. Uh, then she, <laughs> Sorry. Then Jesus said, uh, well, you know the rest of the story. He goes ahead and says a prayer. He said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. Implying that what? This isn't the first prayer that he said about this. He was pre-prayed. <coughs> By that, what I'm saying is he knew back there when he first got word what was to happen. Now he's saying the prayer so that the people listening here knows that it's him in humility still crying out to the Father from whom all things come. He said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me. And this is something that you can pray as well, folks. This is a part of that getting a strong stance and going ahead and pulling yourself out of the emotional uh, train wreck that's going to keep happening if you don't. Father, I thank you. You've heard me. I know that you always hear me. God does the believer he even hears the unbeliever. He said, I knew that you always hear me, but I said this 
for the benefit of the people standing here so that they may believe that you've sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice. And just like that, after praying that, he goes, Lazarus, come on out. Remember what he told the guys earlier? He's asleep. He's just waking him up. When he did, it said the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus told him to go ahead and take the clothes off. I've got to wrap up here and go back to a passage of Scripture that I want you to see. It's in the book of Philippians. And there's so many I could use for you, but I want to draw together that as John wrote this story that Paul learned. And I want you to see a little bit with me in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, as we wrap up today. I want you to see how Paul learned to begin to, again, control his emotions with, with faith that was fact-based. How instead of just allowing himself to snowball with emotions down the hill, that he put, a, put the brakes on and stopped to climb back up the hill. And what he's talking to here is in chains, okay? He writes this book of Philippians as the worship team comes up. He writes this book of Philippians from a jail cell probably has the bracelets on. We don't know. But he's writing. He said, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. What he's talking about here is being imprisoned. Not once, a dozen times or so it seems, but this one's getting closer to the last time. He said, I want you to know, it's not quite yet, Julie, let me go. I want you to know, because this is important to grab onto, what has happened to me if you've got your Bibles today, and I hope you carry them because somewhere along the line, we need to be able to circle and write in them. And it may make it harder to read like me and find the numbers, but that's okay. Because this is vital to me, that what has happened to me, you fill in the blank, whatever it's been. Paul says, I'm at a point where my faith allows me to believe and I can actually see that what's happened has actually served to advance the gospel. God uses tragedy, God uses hardship, God, God uses difficulties and things that we go through that seem unfair. He uses it to what? To advance the gospel. What's the gospel? Not just the good news, but it's the good news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, gave up his life that you and I could become the children of God. That's the good news. It's not just that he did that, but the good news is he did do that. But the, the big news then is, are you going to do something about it? And Paul's saying that what's happened because of what I've gone through and because these guys that are stuck with me as my guards, they're beginning to believe in Christ. He goes on from there. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. Not a desirable thing. Not a, I would love to do that, man. I hope I end up in jail. But Paul's saying, you know what? I look at it like this. I'm behind bars. I'm in chains. But they can't get away from me. So he told them. And as they watched, instead of him saying, but I'm innocent, I'm innocent, get me out of here. I need a new lawyer. Paul just continued to give thanks and rejoice and to talk about his God. And as a result, it became clear throughout the whole palace guard to everyone, the reason he's in there is because of Jesus Christ. And I'm gonna have to just keep reading this because it's good. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Your application of your faith through your actions and your attitude is what will go ahead and encourage people, unbelievers and believers. When we don't have it, we discourage them. And our unbelieving friends look at us and go, you don't believe in anything, do you? Or they look at it and go, I can't believe the faith that you have. How can you smile? How can you be so confident? And that's what this passage goes on to say. And then I just want to get down here to the end of how Paul then ends up with what I talked about earlier, the way I want to die. Middle of verse 18, he said, yes. It's a paragraph break. And I will continue to rejoice for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ that what has happened to me will turn out for my ultimate deliverance is what he's saying he's already been saved but he said this is going to ultimately this is going to be my biggest deliverance i eagerly expect and hope that i will in no way be ashamed but i will have sufficient courage in other words i know right now i'm telling you what i feel and believe but i know some days it gets hard but i hope i have sufficient courage so that now as always christ will be exalted in my body and then he says whether by what life or death 
One of the things that I think keeps us from being ready to die is that we don't live for him. When you live for him, you're not afraid of dying. But if you're uncertain about living for Christ, you're uncertain about dying. And then he says that verse that many of us have heard, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And you can read on from there. Your call, your choice. He is the greatest. He is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He couldn't love you more. But he loves everybody else around you. And even the worst person on this earth as much as he loves me and you. We just need to let him know. Stand, respond as God leads.